Hello everyone, my name is Hang. I'm 10 years old and today I will continue reading Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets by J.K. Rowling, illustrated by Jim K. Chapter 7 Mud Blasts and Murmurs Harry spent a lot of time over the next few days judging out of sight whenever he saw Gilderoy Lockhart coming down a corridor. Harder to avoid was Colleen Creeby, who seemed to have memorized Harry's timetable. Nothing seemed to give a Colleen a bigger thrill than to say, All right, Harry, six or seven times a day and hear, Hello, Colleen, back. However, exasperated Harry sounded when he said it. Harry was still angry with Harry about the disaster car journey and Ron's wand was still malfunctioning, surpassing itself on Friday morning by shooting out of Ron's hand in charms and hitting tiny old Professor Flitwick squarely between the eyes, creating a large throbbing green ball where it had struck. So with one and another, Harry was quite glad to reach the weekend. He, Ron, and Hermione were planning to visit Harry on Sunday mor on Saturday morning. Harry, however, was shaken awake several hours earlier than he would have liked by Oliver Wood, captain of the Gryffindor Quidditch team. What's the matter? said Harry groggily. Quidditch practice, said Wood. Come on. Harry squinted at the window. There was a thin mist hanging across the there was a thin mist hanging across the pink and gold sky. Now that he was awake, he couldn't understand how he could have slept through the racket the birds were making. Oliver, Harry croaked. It's the crack of dawn. Exactly, said Wood. There was a tall he was a tall, burly six year, and at the moment his eyes were gleaming with mad enthusiasm. It's a part of a new training program. Come on, grab your broom and let's go, said Wood heartily. None of the other teams have started training yet. We're going to be the first off the mark this year. Yawning and shivering slightly, Harry climbed out of the bed and tried to find his quidditch ropes. Good man, said Wood. Meet you on the pitch in 15 minutes. When he found his scarlet team ropes and pulled on his cloak for warmth, Harry scribbled a note to Rod explaining where he had gone and went down to the spiral staircase to the common room. His nimble stood 2,000 on his shoulder. He had just reached the portrait hole when there was a clutter behind him and Colin Creevy came dashing down from the spiral staircase, his camera swishing madly, swinging madly around his neck and something clutched in his hand. I heard someone say your name on the stair. Sorry, looks what I've got here. I developed. I've had it developed. I wanted to show you. Harry looked bemusedly at the photograph Colin was brandishing under his nose. A moving black and white Lockhart was tugging hard on an arm. Harry neck is recognized as his own. He was pleased to see that the photographic self was putting up a good fight and refusing to be dragged into view. As Harry watched, Lucas gave up and slumped and slumped painting against the painting. <coughs> the white at the white edge of the picture. Will you sign it? said Colin eagerly. Nope said Harry flatly, glancing around to check that the room was really deserted. Sorry, Colin, I'm in a hurry. <coughs> Quidditch practice. He climbed through the portrait hole. Oh, wow, wait for me. I've never watched a Quidditch game before. Colin scrambled through the hole after him. It's really boring, said Harry quickly, but Colin ignored him. His face was shining with excitement. You were the youngest house player in hundreds of years, weren't you, Harry? Weren't you, said Colin, trotting alongside him. You must be brilliant. I've never flown. Is it easy? Is that your own room? Is that the best one there is? Harry didn't know how to get rid of him. It was lo like having an extremely talkative shadow. I don't really understand Quidditch, said Colin breathlessly. Is it true there are four balls and two of them fly around to trying to knock people off their brooms? Yes, said Harry heavily. 
resigned to explaining the complicated, the complicated rules of Quidditch. They are called bludgers, and there are two beaters on each team who carry clubs to beat the bludgers away from their side. Fred and George Weasley are the Gryffindor beaters. And what are the other balls for? Colin asked, tripping down a couple of steps because he was getting open mouth as Harry. Well, the couple, the quaffle, that's the biggest, biggish red one. It is the one that scores goal. Three chasers on three chasers on each stream throw the quaffle to each other and try to get it through the goalpost at the end of the pitch. There are three long holes with hoops at on the end. And the fourth ball? It's the golden snitch, said Harry. And it's very small. <laughs> very fast and difficult to catch. But that's what the seekers got to do. Because a game of Quidditch doesn't end until the snitch has been caught. And whichever team seekers get the snitch earns his team an extra 150 points. And you're the Gryffindor seeker, aren't you? Said Colin in awe. Yes, said Harry as they left the castle and started across the dew-drenched grasses. And there's the keeper too. He guards the goalpost. That's it, really. But Colin didn't stop questioning Harry all the way down the sloping lawns to the Quidditch pitch. And Harry only shook him off when he reached the changing room. Colin called after him after him in a piping voice. I'll go and get a good seat, Harry, and hurried off to the stands. The rest of the Gryffindor team were already in the changing room. Wood was the only person who looked truly awake. Fred and George C. Weasley were sitting cuffed eyes and tousled hair next to a fourth year Alicia Spinnett, Alicia Spinnett, who seemed to be <coughs> nodding off against the wall behind her. Her fellow chasers, Katie Bell and Angelina Johnson, were yawning side by side. Opposite them, There you are, Harry. What kept you? said Wood briskly. Now, I wanted a quick talk with you before we actually get onto the pitch because I spent the summer devising the whole new training program, which I think will make a difference. Wood was holding up a large diagram of a Quidditch pitch on the on which were drawn many lines, arrows, and crosses in different colored inks. He took out his wand, tapped the board, and the arrows began to wiggle over the diagram like caterpillars as Wood launched his speech up into a speech about his new tactics. Fred and Dor Fred Weasley's head drooped right onto Alicia Spinnett's roll shoulder and he began to snore. The first word took nearly 20 minutes to explain, but there was another board under that and a third one under that. Harry sank into a stupor as Wood droned on and on. So, said Wood at long last, jerking Harry from a wistful fantasy about what he could be eating for breakfast in the at this very moment up at the castle. Is that clear? Any questions? I've got a question, Oliver, said George, who had woken up with a start. What could have you have told us yesterday while we are awake? Wood wasn't pleased. Now listen here, you lot, he said, glaring at them all. We should have won the Quidditch World Cup last year. We're easily the best team, but unfortunately, owing to circumstances, we beyond the, our control. Harry shifted guiltily in his seat. He had been unconscious as the hospital wing for the final match for the previous year, meaning that Gryffindor had been a player short and suffered the worst defeat in 300 years. Wood took a moment to regain control for himself. Their last defeat was clearly still torturing him. So this year, we will train harder than ever before, okay? Let's, let's go and put our new theories into practice, Wood shouted, seizing his room and leading them out of, leading the way out of the changing room. 
stiff sled and still yawning, his team followed. They had been in the changing room so long that the sun was up probably now. Although the remnants of mist hung over the grass in the stadium, as Harry walked onto the pitch, he saw Ron and Hermione standing, sitting in their stand. Aren't you finished yet? S called Ron incredulously. Haven't even started, said Harry, looking jealously at the toast. Looking jealously at the toast and the marmalade Ron and Hermione had brought out from the Great Hall. Wood's been teaching us new moves. He mounted his broomstick and kicked off, kicked off the ground, soaring up into the air. The cool morning air